Um, at first, I would say I am one of the last arable and crop production professors at our faculty. And so I want to show you some nice flowering plants, as you can see in top of this uh, chart. And I want to show you what you can do with these plants. Um, when we go forward, uh, there is the arable farming strategy 2035. And when you look to this arable farming strategy, you will find one topic, uh, crop diversity. It's a topic uh, by Fenorop, but you will find three other topics. And one topic is low input plants, plants for bioeconomy, and, and this is important for today, perennials. And I think this is a little bit new for Fenorop. And so I, I want to show you a little bit more about these aspects, low input plants, plants for bioeconomy and perennials. Uh, last year, there was the World Climate Conference in Glasgow, and there was a big discussion how you can store CO2. And there were three aspects of agriculture, special important. First, more um, planting more trees to bind CO2. The other one is uh, the more bioenergy plants and then the technical storage of the CO2 by burning these plants, and more organic farming, um, more uh, organic matter in the soil by biochar or by reduced soil tillage. These are the, the aspects that are important. And when you have a bigger look to this, when you look to Europe, there are the, the sustainable development goals, there's a discussion farm to fork by the Green Deal, and there is an aspect, it's called greening measurements. And all farmers has to fill, fulfill the greening measurements, we also at Campus Can Altenhof. But in future, there will be the so-called eco schemes. And as farmer, you have to fulfill these things that are in discussion and it will start 2033. So, and when you see this, when you see the discussion, the plants are very important. And in the middle of this picture, I show you this plant, the sunflower. And I think everybody of you knows the sunflower. And everybody of you know that the sunflower is a is an annual plant, but this isn't, isn't so. The sunflower is a perennial plant. When you would ask uh, Max Weigand in the botanical garden, uh, he would say you only one type is an annual plant of the sunflower, and all other sunflowers are perennial plants. And we grow them at Campus Can Altenhof, as you can see in the pictures, and at the Land Institute. There is a big breeding project. Uh, they are working with the perennial sunflowers, as you can see the left side, and they develop oil plants, perennial oil plants, and maybe in future, in, in, in the nearly future, the sunflowers are perennial sunflowers with big flowers and high oil content. And the perennial um, has the potential to re-establish many of the ecosystem service problems that we supported from the original, original natural ecosystem. This is a side chart from uh, Cruz and Catani. And they show that in the past tense, as you can see on the left side, we have the natural ecosystem with many perennial high biodiversity aspects. We have a soil formation, you have nutrients retained, um, you have the weed establishment suppressed by these perennial natural habitats. And when you grow annual uh, plants, you have a low biodiversity, you may have soil erosion, you have the weed establishment, easier and you have many, many other problems. You have a reduction of uh, organic matter. And when you move to the perennial moderate biodiversity, you have many positive aspects as you have seen by the perennial natural ecosystem. And this is not only an idea from these both uh, or from me. We are, we, I, I work with perennials since the beginning of my own diploma. Um, there was a conference in Lund uh, for some years, and there was the question, is the future of agriculture perennial? And there are many experts in the whole world 
who think about this question. And in this picture, you see the perennial wheat. And they say, maybe in future, and also in our maybe in our phenorop experiments, we have to, to look to the perennial wheat instead of the annual wheat. Yeah, rethinking from annual monocultures to polycultures. Um, every student has seen this picture uh, um, in, in every lesson, the thing source relation. Perennial plants, they put their nutrients back to the rhizomes. Because of that, uh, they are low input plants um, because they, they, they transcolate their nutrients, um, they dry over winter, and so on. It's a simple system. But when you look a little bit more and when you compare annual and perennial plants, um, the, the roots they have to start every year by the perennials. But by the perennials, you have uh, the development of the roots over a long time. You have problems with nutrients, with erosion the drought stress, the weeds, and so on. And um, the carbon is very important. Uh, um, in average, annual plants have a demand, nearly seven tons CO2 per hectare a year, and the perennials bind 30 tons CO2 per year, and they are low input plants. When you go a little bit more in detail, you see this in this nice picture. On the left side, you see, you see the winter wheat uh, in every month. And on the other side, you see the perennial um, winter, uh, perennial wheat, it's called wheat grass. And here you see the development of the roots. In, in December, you see here the winter wheat. And on the other side, you see the wheat grass. It's a, a stronger, a longer, a bigger root system in this, the uh, root system has effects of many, many things. As you can see here in this picture, you have by the, by, by the rooting system, you have not a problem with erosion. You have a higher water holding capacity. Uh, you have not problems so much with drought stress, for example, the losses of nutrients. But in this picture, there is one thing extremely important. On the left side, you see three suns, and on the right side, you see five suns. And it's important that the vegetation period is much more longer by the perennial plants. And so the plants can bind much more CO2 than all the annual plants. In the binding of CO2, I think it will be a more interest in many, many research programs in future. Um, I'm an expert of miscanthus. I write my diploma about miscanthus dissertation habilitation, and we write 2016 a paper introducing miscanthus to the greening measurements because there are many, many aspects that what you can uh, solve with growing, solving with uh, growing of miscanthus, and. Um, with this paper, we achieve that 2018 is what it was allowed that miscanthus is a greening culture. At the same time, we achieve that also the cuplands is, uh, is allowed uh, that the farmers can grow them as greening culture. And the idea must not now be not only planting miscanthus, cupland, and so on in the whole region. The idea is that we plant some fields of these, as you can see in the pictures, nice flowering plants, different flowering um, plants. And then you have a benefit for the whole region, also for the sugar beets, for the wheat fields, and so on. This is the idea to co combine the arable normal crops with these low input per annual uh, nice flowering crops. And then it's a special that these all plants, and especially these perennial plants, has a high photosynthesis activity. Uh, miscanthus is a C4 plant as maize, and miscanthus binds 30 tons CO2 per hectare in the, every year. No other plants can bind this that you can grow here in Germany until now. 30 tons, it's uh, very, very much. Um, in the ground, it's a perennial plant. There's also the organic matter goes up. There is a binding of five tons CO2 per hectare. And I think this is important that, that we bind CO2 in the first step in the plant. And then the plant does have photosynthesis that produces sugar. And the sugar 
how does this sugar of these glucose molecules, the plant build up a special infrastructure? As you can see here, it's uh, producing cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, and so on. And we say this plant, this special plant, it would be stupid to burn this plant only. We must use this plant's intelligent. And so we developed the cascade utilization pathways for this interesting biomass. We have to use the biomass more times. The first time for ecosystem services, then we use, for example, this material as growing substrate. Um, Mrs. Nugen, as you can see on Down's uh, defense uh, dissertation this Monday, that's excellent. And then this material goes in our heating system and then you have a silica rich ash. And this ash you can bring back to the field as fertilizer. But it's, it's, uh, it's the idea that we use uh, the biomass four times, but this is not enough. You can also pr produce uh, paper out of this material, or you can use in the first step the miscanthus, in the second step as bedding material, as we have tested at Frankenforst. Then we bring this material in the greenhouse, we use it as growing material, we use it second times. And then we bring it, for example, to our heating system. Then we have the ash, the silica ash you can use for building materials, long life products, and you store the CO2 from the beginning in the last product, in the long life product. And this is uh, what we, we are researching in, in different projects uh, with different products and with, also with different cultures. And the interesting culture is also the cup plant. Um, the cup plant, um, there was, there have been many trials with our Institute of Land Technik. Um, the colleagues, uh, um, Schulze Lammers, they developed the, the sowing of this plant. In the, in the past tense, you could only plant, and now you can sow the cup plant. Then you establish in the first year the cup plants and you sow at the same time maize and so the, the farmer can harvest the maize in the first year and after the next year the plants grow up uh, every year two three meters high and the special thing here is that the, the cup plant uh, has uh, uh, extremely late in the year and long flowering periods sometimes six, seven, eight months. And then you can harvest the plant, for example, it's, it's uh, for biogas. And here I would say, is this really a good idea to use this special plant um, as biogas? What would be the acceptance by the society when you drive, as you can see it here in the picture with a mice harvester in these nice flowering plants? And so um, the idea is we must uh, have a more intelligent use of this uh, special biomass. In one example, you can see here um, the colleagues uh, from Neckarsulm, they combine this, they produce biogas and at the same time fibers for the paper production. The development of the production of these uh, paper out of natural fibers are from our institute. We developed the grass paper for the um, Rewe concern. And here the colleagues developed this for the Lidl group. Um, and they want to produce um, this packaging material out of the cut plant. But it's not so easy. Um, they need many tons. As you can see here, it's a project from the University of Hohenheim. Um, but there is a little group behind, and so it could be a big market in future. Um, we are looking more in detail. We use the biomass, we, we, we chop the material, we seize the material, and it's not so really easy to get special pieces out of the biomass that you can use it for paper and packaging material production. And it's important that you have a special length and width of the fibers and the ratio of, uh, of length and width is very important that you can produce papers, as you can see now in the picture here, 
that, that are strong enough that you can use it. And we have a, a com complete uh, laboratory for paper production here at Campus Can Altendorf, and we're developing products out of these plants, but it's very tricky to do this. It's not really easy. Parallel, the colleagues from the University of Trier uh, has published a paper at the end of last year, and they compare woody biomass as poplar or willow with uh, brown biomass. Here you see, for example, the silphy um, perennial biomass plants that they harvest in the, in the major state or in the green stage, for example, for biogas, and they compare this with annual plants. And they show here the export of nutrients, different nutrients. And uh, very fast, you can see that the green harvest of perennial biomass plants is a little bit similar to the annual plants. And so they say it's important, not really every perennial plant is a low input plant. It's important when you harvest these plants, if you harvest this in autumn or in spring or on which time and how the major and the water content of the material is. These are the aspects um, that are very important. You, you need um, um, colleagues who have experience how to cultivate the biomass that you can then at the end develop a product out of it. You want to use the late flowering period that the, the, the beneficial insects have a big input. For that, we, we, we have a problem with the material. The cup plant um, is a cup plant because they, the, the cup plant collected their water in the leaves, as you can see a little, little bit here. And we have developed the cupless cup plant, as you can see on the right side. Because there's a problem, you have the water uh, in, in the plant, in, in, the, in the whole crop, and then you may have many problems with fungi, especially sclerotemia. And so we need other type of plant. We have developed this, we have selected this, and then you can uh, have a late harvest. And so it's possible that you can harvest the major crop, as you can see in the picture. And we have at Campus Kein Altendorf the worldwide I repeat, the worldwide biggest gene pool of silphium. This is, you can see a little bit here in the picture. And we develop special plants for special uses out of this. And here we work together with the colleagues from the Land Institute. It's the same colleague, David van Tassel, who developed the perennial sunflower. And he has the other type of uh, silphium. It's called silphium integrifolium, and this is it's a plant where you can get oil of, out of the seeds. And he developed the perennial um, oil silphium type. And now we work together. We would do this in a new BioSC project. We want to combine this. We have or the colleague David has uh, super feminized, as you can see here in the picture, a super feminized integrifolium type with many um, seeds and then many oil. We have the high um, yielding biomass, the cupless biomass plant. We combine this to a new multipurpose silphium hybrid so that you can do both. We have high biomass and the oil, and we think that we have many. Uh, um, value editing processes that we can get out of this. And there we are working together with the Forschungszentrum Jülich. We hope that we get this BioSC project in some days, weeks, we are waiting. And beneath these two crops, Scantos, the cup plant, there is another very interesting um, plant, the tree, Paulovnia. We started there 2008-2010, there was a spin-off of, of us uh, founded the Vigro. And this picture is here for nearly one. So you can see, and this tree is also a flowering tree, but it's in, in the beginning of the year. Um, when is the flowering period, it's one of the fastest growing trees of the world. And um, you see this a little bit here in the picture. 
einer can plant uh, Palovnia and then he can harvest this uh, after 12 years. And then he can do this, uh, I would say, uh, six, seven times more um, because it's extremely fast growing. And fast growing means it binds many CO2. And then we want to combine this, for example, with uh, perennial um, medicinal plants. We have developed uh, Beos garlic, for example, for a company. Uh, we, um, we have developed a system that you can grow this culture in the open field. It's not so easy because normally garlic uh, is growing in the woods. And so the idea is that we could combine this um, perennial plants in one field, as you see a little bit here in, in this picture. So it's, it's a possibility that you can produce food and feed or fiber or energy at the same time. Or we combine Paulovnia with the apple mint. We developed here at Campus Kain Altendorf the apple mint and it's called Meckenheimer Apfelminze. It's a regional product. And the packaging material is out, also out of these plants. And so we have a bubble product, the, the, the mince, the apple mint, Meckenheimer apple mint, and the product is also from the material. And so we have a, a special regional product. We bind CO2 with the plants. And so we combine all this. When I come back to the, one of the first charts you see here, um, planting new trees, there is a big interest from many um, companies and also from, from ministry uh, that we, we have many, would have many trials um, with the Paulovnia tree because of the fast growing and then fast bind, big fine binding of CO2. Bioenergy is uh, not, I would say, not the correct uh, Wording, I would say biomass plantations uh, would be good. And then we are developing products out of this. We have developed a plastering material. We have a patent to this. Or we build houses like here, the workbox in Meckenheim. This house is only built with uh, Paulovnia and Miscantos. And on the other side, as you can see here, the leaves are falling down over winter. And so you have uh, the upcoming organic matter in these perennial crops, for example. And all this we would uh, combine in a new project. We hope that we get this in the middle of this year. It's called Certifix. So the take home message is um, are more perennial polyculture and perspective for agriculture, sustainable agriculture? Yes, they are often uh, low input crops. They are mostly drought tolerant. The high CO2 binding, I think, is extremely important. They fulfill the ecosystem schemes or the eco schemes. The cascade utilization is possible. It's ecological and economical. And very important, there will be a high social acceptance. And now we the idea is how we can come from these ideas to Uwe Russia. <laughs> and it's very easy, Uwe, um, <laughs> um, when we see this picture <laughs> by the face experiment, you blow up very, very much CO2 up in the air and we bind this CO2 with our perennial crops at Campus Canal North and so we can see we are working together. Thank you very much for your attention.